faith that God can do and will do what he said he was going to do. Amen? See, we're, we're knee-deep in this series talking about renewing of our minds. Of how God wants to work in us, Jesus wants to work in us, that we might begin to think, that we might be able to begin to see the way he thinks and the way he sees. He wants our mind tuned into his world, not this world. Of how his world works and not how this world works. And, and it comes down to our mind focused on those things and, and believing those things, having faith in those things which he has declared. So last week we were talking about that there is this, there's power in what Jesus says. There's power in what he says. And, and, so, and we've looked at the, the, the story of the feeding of the 5,000, and, and we kind of you know, took a fresh look at that, and we, we talked about how you know, here they were, they, they, they had all these people gathered on a hillside, you remember the story, right? And, and it got late in the day, and they were hungry and hadn't eaten all day, and the disciples were like, Jesus, what are we going to do? Well, let's just send them away. We not anything we can really do about this. And, and Jesus says to them, well, what do you got? And then they're like, well, we don't have enough, you know, there's not enough money, and we don't have any food, and, and Jesus says, well, go look, and when they went and looked, what'd they find? They found five loaves and two fishes, and they're like, in their minds, they're like, Jesus, can we send them away now? You know, we don't, still don't have enough, and Jesus is like, uh, no, sit down, get ready, because that's enough, and, and what happened? That Jesus took the loaves and the fishes, he gave thanks for them, and then what'd he do? He broke them, put them in the disciples' hands, and they went and they began to break off pieces of bread and pieces of fish, and they fed 15,000 people with plenty left over. And what an incredible thing that they fed the people. And this truth that Jesus didn't perform the miracle on his own, Jesus particip the disciples participated in the miracle with Jesus. See, there's a big difference between Jesus doing it all and we get to watch and Jesus enabling the miracle to happen in our hands. And truth be told, that's a little unnerving for some of us. Amen. Come on, Steve. Right? Amen. Uh, our brother is, is so honest. He said, you know what? I hear you, man, but it's a little scary. Amen. Come on, it's much easier when Jesus just does, does it? You know, we'll, we'll sit over here, Jesus, you do this stuff, and we'll watch, and we'll rejoice, and we'll, glory, and we'll praise you for it. But when Jesus says, no, no, I'd like, to do, I'd like you to do it. I'd like to do it through you. All of a sudden, that, that becomes a whole different scenario, and we, and we get a little nervous and a little shaky. But I want you to understand, what was Jesus doing in that, in that story? He was trying to teach the disciples to think like he thinks. He was wanting to renew their minds. And it's interesting. In the four Gospels, there are only three stories that appear in all four. Did you know that? Number one was when Jesus entered public ministry. It appears in all four Gospels. His death, burial, and resurrection is in all four Gospels. You know what the only other thing is? The feeding of the 5,000. The only other story that appears in all four Gospels. Why? I believe it's because Jesus wants to transform the way we think about the things that he says and the things he asks for us to do. And that's the piece. You say, well, you know, Brian, I, I, we can't do what Jesus did. He's God. Yes, he's God, all right. 100% God. But Scripture also teaches Jesus was 100% man. And what, we, what Scripture teaches is that Jesus didn't do what he did. He didn't heal the sick and give sight to the blind as, as God. No, he set aside his deity and as a human being in right relationship with God, full of Holy Spirit, he did what the Father desired as an illustration and an example for us. Because listen to me, any human beings in the room... Come on now. How many human beings in the room are in right relationship with God and full of Holy Spirit? Jesus says, hey, I want you to understand, I, you are now prepared and equipped to do what I did. Because you're gonna, you have the same package that he had and the same package he operated out of. He says that about you. Now, most, a lot of Christians don't believe that. 
Because well, surely he couldn't do that in me. I, 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 we, we can't listen to the maybe we don't understand it yet. We have to listen to what does God say. What was the key? What was the key to that story? What did Jesus say? What did Jesus say? There's power in the word of Jesus. Now, we're going to pick up the rest of the story, because here's the thing. We're not done. Woo! Man, we only got part of the story. You think, you think the first part was cool. Wait, wait until you get to the second part of the story. Because look what it says here in verse 45. It says, and immediately Jesus, in Mark chapter 6, if you're following along in your Bible, sorry. Mark 6, and immediately Jesus had his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side to Bethsaida, which he himself dis- dismissed the crowd. And after saying goodbye to them, he left for the mountain to pray. So, here they finish feeding the 5,000, they collect up all the leftovers, everybody's fed, everybody's happy. Jesus says to the disciples, here's the deal, I'm going to send them home now. All right, I, I've done what I need to do with them, all right? Now, I want you to get in the boat, and I want you to go to the other side of the lake. Now, we realize that the feeding of the 5,000 happened on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. Because remember, where were they going? They were going on vacation, they were taking the weekend off. When you go camping, where do you go, Brenda? You go to the woods, amen? You go to an unpopulated area. The eastern side of the sea was unpopulated. They were going to go have, a, you know, have some weenies and, and marshmallows and s'mores over there where nobody else was so they could be by themselves. But the crowd showed up, remember? They all ran around the lake and came over there. And so that's where they are. And then Jesus says, I want you to go to Bethsaida. Now, it's not the Bethsaida at the top. There's actually another Bethsaida on the western side called Bethsaida Galilee. And he says, and we know he went there because Gennesaret is where they eventually ended up. All right? So he says, I want you to go across. Now, I want you to notice it's the widest part of the sea, if you're going east to west. The widest part, 8 to 10 miles. Now, that's not very far. You know, you all have been on bigger bodies of water probably, and so it wasn't that far. But, you know, on the Sea of Galilee, you know, they did not have an outboard. You know, they had the oars. All right? So we're, we're rowing. You know, and, and, and so he says, get in the boat, here's what we're going to do. Verse 47 says, and when it was evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on land. Now, that gives us an interesting picture. Jesus is up on the mountain. It's only 8 to 10 miles across, so 4 miles out in the water. They've been rowing for maybe an hour or so. I mean, 6 o'clock evening is 6 p.m., almost sunset. All right, and so Jesus is up on the mountain. He can see him out there. They're making progress, but they're still out in the middle of the lake. All right? So that's what's going on. They're rolling along. Verse 48, And seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them, at about the fourth watch of the night. Now, here's the deal. In the middle of the night, Jesus says, Hey, they're still out there. They're still out there in the middle of the lake. What happened was the wind came up and they were rowing. And the, you, you, ever, you, I, you got a little rowboat at your house. You ever been out on the pond and the wind's blowing and you're trying to go against the wind? Do you get very far? You row a lot, but don't get nowhere. That's the disciples, all right? So it's not like, you know, some other stories where the waves are crashing over the boat or anything, nothing like that. It's just they're straining and they're hurting and, and, and they're working and they're working and they're working and they're working. Now, here's the interesting thing. It's in the middle of the night now. How many of you are like Jesus can see out in the middle of the lake? Pro- probably because they had some, some cool lights on the boat, Right? No, no. In the natural, there was no sea in any boats in the middle of the, ocean, uh, middle of the sea, even if you're up on the mountain. Jesus in the Spirit saw them struggling. Now, that's good news for you, amen? Because that means that Jesus sees what you're going through. You say, well, I'm kind of I'm out, out of sequence. I'm not in the right place. But guess what? Jesus sees you. He sees what you're going through. He knows what's happening in your life. He knows what's taking place. Even if no one else does, he knows. You say, well, pastor, if he knows, how how, how come he ain't breaking in? Well, let's keep reading. All right. Jesus sees what's happening, what's going on with them in the fourth watch of the night. Now, you got to know the fourth watch in the Jewish world was after 3 a.m. Okay, so now can can we do math? Okay, 6 p.m., they're in the middle of the lake. Nine hours plus later, where are they at? They're still in the middle of the lake. How many of you know that Rowan, for all that time, were tired, were wore out, they're exhausted? Um, and so it says that about the fourth hour, in the watch of the night, he came 
to them walking on the sea. So Jesus comes down off the mountain. He's walking on the sea. And I love this statement. And he intended to pass by them. Y'all look at me like, what? What's that doing in there? Because here it is, you know, here it is. So here they are rolling out here, and Jesus is like, hey, yeah, hey, where's Jesus going? He's going to the other side of the lake. So Jesus comes down. He's walking on the water. You know, he doesn't have a boat, so he's got to get there some way. So he's going to walk on the water. And, and here are the guys over here. And he was just, you know, going you know, to pass on by. Go on over and wait for him on shore. That's what it says. You know, you, you're like, what's Jesus doing? He sees them struggling. He sees the wind causing the trouble. Why would he just go on by? Well, here's what you've got to understand. Jesus had already given them all they needed to get to the other side. He said, well, they were struggling. Well, look at verse 49. But when he saw him, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and they cried out, for they saw him, and they were terrified. So here's the scene. Jesus is walking along. Now, think about that. Jesus is walking along on the water. You know, you're out in the middle of, you've been rowing forever. You're out there rowing, and all of a sudden, you know, Peter's like, Guys, guys, you see that over there? What in the world's that? I, I don't know, John, what do you think that is? I, that kind of looks like a man. Uh, that, that's some dude out there on the wall. Uh, that's a ghost. And you know what? As I read that, it's almost like they start squealing like little girls. They are terrified that there is a ghost out on the water. So they're all shook up, and they're like, man, what are we going to do? <laughs> And look what it says, verse, it goes on, verse 50, it says, But immediately he spoke to them and said to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Now here they are freaking out, and all of a sudden Jesus says to them, from across the sea, across the water, Hey, don't be afraid, it is I. And all of a sudden they're like, Oh, oh it's Jesus, Woo, no problem. Jesus just, you know, walking on the water is no big deal. How many times in our lives do we get all worked up and Jesus has to say this, hey, 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 don't be afraid. It's okay. It's me. I'm here. I'm here. Now, here's the interesting question. Why didn't Jesus have to identify himself? Now, you've got to get the picture, right? Because there's this thing walking across the water. We have no idea what it is. We're squealing like little girls because we're terrified about what's going on, and all Jesus says, hey, it's me. And they're like, oh, okay. What happened? They recognized Jesus' voice. They had no idea who it was until they heard his voice. That ever happened to you? I mean, you're like out in the backyard, and it's dark, pitch black, and you're out there, and all of a sudden you hear a noise, and you're like, what in the world is that? You know, is that a, you know, about a mountain lion, or, you know, what is that thing out there, and a bear, what is that? And all of a sudden, you know, your spouse, or your, or your kids, or your grandkids say, it's okay, it's just me. And as soon as you hear your voice, you're like, oh, it's, it's okay. Why? Because we know their voice. And we have to understand that Jesus' desire is that we would know his voice voice that he would speak to us you say well i'm not sure jesus talks to me i'm not sure i can, I, I can hear his voice i know a lot of us have been told that but listen that's not what the word says in fact in john 10 it says this jesus says i am the good shepherd and i know my sheep and my sheep know me and just as the father knows me i know the father and i lay down my life for the sheep but here's verse 27 my sheep know my voice and I know them, and they follow me. My sheep. Any sheep in the house? Well, come on. Any, any followers of Jesus in the house? Jesus' expectation is that we would know his voice. Amen? That we would not only would know, we'd recognize it, that when we hear it, we would know. Normal operating mode for the believer, to know the voice of Jesus. Verse 51 goes on. It says, then Jesus, now, so now he's coming over, now that he says, hey, it's me, and he walks on over to the boat. It says, then he got in the boat with them, and the wind stopped, and they were astonished. Now, watch this now. You say, well, Brian, why are we so looking at this story? Because this story ties back to the previous story. Watch now. For 
They had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. In the, new, in the NIV, it says, verse 52, but they had not understood about the loaves. Now, you've got to get this. You know, see, that's just one little phrase that if we don't catch it, we miss the whole point of the story. What was going on? Jesus said, you guys, you guys don't understand because you missed the meaning of the loaves. Now, we've got to get the progression of what's going on. What's Jesus talking about? The key is, what did Jesus say, right? What did Jesus say? Jesus said, get in the boat and go to the other side, right? All right, but look what the progression's been happening. Think about this. All right, let's go back a couple stories, all right? So Jesus calls the 12 together. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go out and proclaim the kingdom, and I want you to pray for the sick, and they go out. And they start proclaiming the kingdom of God. They start praying for the sick and for the blind and and for the lame and and, and casting out demons, right? That's what we read that story. We looked at that story. And then they come back and they're like, Jesus, it was unbelievable, man. We got out there and we're proclaiming the kingdom and, man, we're praying for the sick and they're getting healed and and the lame are walking and the blind are seeing and the demons, man. we, We spoke to demons and they took off when we told them to get out. It's awesome. And Jesus... The question is, well, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, go proclaim the kingdom. And then they get back, and there's this impromptu meeting. All these people show up on the shore. They're having this meeting, and all of a sudden it gets the end of the day, and they're all hungry. And and they're like, Jesus, sending them away. But no, Jesus says what? You feed them. And then what happens? Man, they, they, they come up with five loaves and two fish, and Jesus prays over and breaks it and puts it in their hands, and this incredible miracle happens out of their hands, and they feed the people. Right? Jesus said, you feed them. What was the, what's Jesus trying to teach them? That when Jesus tells you to do something, they already have the ability to do it. Come on. And, and over and over, when Jesus says this, Everything necessary for that to happen, he's already taken care of. And now they get in the boat. And he says what? Go to the other side. They got a message from Jesus. Jesus, here's here's my word, here's my will right now, go to the other side. And so they get in the boat and the wind's beating against them and they, they can't get out there and they've been rowing and rowing and rowing and rowing. And yet when Jesus sees them straining, when Jesus sees them battling the obstacle, he's going to walk on by. Why? Because he's already given them what they needed. He already gave them his word. See, what's happening is they began to function and and do what Jesus said to do, but then a storm came up. An obstacle occurred. And Jesus' expectation would be, you know what? They're going to overcome it. By the power of my name, they're going to overcome the obstacle. They're going to overcome the barrier to fulfill, to go where I said to go. Why? Because I've empowered them to get there. See, Jesus wanted the disciples to understand, but more importantly, he wants us to understand that when he gives us a word, he has already given us the power and authority to carry it out. That is the story we're looking at. That's what he wanted to teach him. And listen, that's hard. Amen? Because here's what happens. Here's what the disciples were doing, right? We're in the boat, we're rowing, and we see the waves, and we see the wind, and we see a long way away, and we see us not making any progress, and we're like, I don't think we can make it. And Jesus is like, what did I say? He said, go to the other side. Jesus said, what are you worried about then? What, what do I say? See, Jesus wanted them to understand when he says it, 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 it's, it's done when we're obedient to do it. He will carry it out. Now, in Mark's gospel, that's where the story ends. But it's in all four gospels. And in Matthew, he picks up the same story. He's, he's telling the same story, only he gives us a little more detail. So let's look at Matthew 14. Matthew 14, and, and I love this part because it, it illustrates everything that Jesus has been trying to teach him. Matthew 14 And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, verse 25, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Now, how many are like, man, that sounds familiar? 
That's almost, almost word for word from Mark to Matthew, okay? So we know it's the exact same story, right? All right, here we go. Verse 28. But Peter replies, all right? Peter responds to him and says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, Peter's like in the boat. Peter's rowing. You know, Peter, here he is. Peter's rowing. Whew. All right? We're rowing along. Jesus says, it's me. And Peter stands up in the boat, and he looks out at Jesus, and he says, Jesus, if it's you. Now, Peter already knows it's him. All right? He recognizes his voice. And essentially saying, Jesus, I know it's you. If you tell me to get out of this boat and walk on the water and come to you, I'll get out of the boat, walk on the water, and come to you. Now, what's happening? Peter's getting it. Man, we give Peter such a hard time. Peter's clued in. He's starting to get to understand the loaves and the fish. He's like, man, if Jesus says I can do it, I can do it. So he says, Jesus, here's the deal. Do you want me to come out there or not? Do you want me to get out of the boat and come and stand there? In verse 29, and it says, Jesus said, come. And Peter stood up, Peter got out of the boat and walked in the water and came towards Jesus. Now, I'm about to wreck the story for some of you. All right? Because here's why, here, here's the story you and I were taught. Here's what we hear, here's what we read. Peter gets out of the boat, right? Jesus says, come. So Peter steps out of the boat, and immediately he begins to sink. And immediately Jesus, he cries out, and Jesus has to rescue him. Now I want you to look at this picture. I searched high and low for a picture where Peter was not sinking. 99% of the pictures of this story on the internet all have Peter about waist deep in the water. But that's not what the text says. Look at it with me. What's the text say? See, we've got to read the word for what it says, not what the flannel graph said. Amen? What's it say? Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. Now, you got to get the picture. I need a Jesus. Would you help me there? Steve, would you stand right there? You be Jesus. I'm in the boat. You're, you're out there on the water, all right? I'm rowing. All right. Oh, hey, Jesus. C come. Come. So Peter gets out of the boat, stands on the water, takes multiple steps on the water, and gets to Jesus. And then it says, he began to notice the waves, right, and the wind, and he began to doubt. Now, that's where we all pick up the story. Well, he began to doubt. We forgot all about the six steps Peter already took on the water. We were just like, well, if Peter doubted, and Jesus had to rescue him. All right, we'll, we'll use you again here in a second. See, that's the picture we have. Why? Why have we heard it that way? Because we don't believe that we can do what Jesus says we can do. See, we would much rather default to, we're going to doubt, we're going to fail, we can't do it. How many of you have ever heard it said that there's only one person who ever walked on water? You've heard that said, amen? That's a lie. Peter walked on the water. I'm pretty sure if Peter can walk on water, you can if Jesus says so. Amen. Come on, do you believe? See, that's a renewing of our mind. That's a different way of thinking. Well, Jesus, I'm just not sure we can do it. What did Jesus say? What did he say? He said, Peter, come to me. And Jesus enabled Peter to walk on the water. What a powerful picture. Verse 30. It says, And seeing the wind, he became frightened. And when he began to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And it says that immediately, verse 31, Jesus reached out his hand, took hold of him. And he said to him, you of little faith. Now, where's he saying this? Out on the water. Amen. Out in the middle of the, in the, middle of the waves and the wind. Why did you doubt? Now, we're like, well, Jesus was chastising him. Jesus was not chastising Peter. Peter had already got out of the boat, walked six steps, and then he began to sink. And I want you to notice something powerful here. It says that Jesus reached out his hand and took Peter's hand. 
Now, there's something interesting there. That couldn't happen unless Peter had already gotten to Jesus. Come on, because if I reach out my hand, i got to be pretty close to get a hold of Steve's hand. Amen? So here he is, almost to Jesus, walk clear out there, and all of a sudden he begins to sink. See, the primary issue we struggle with is doubting what Jesus said. See, there's this, this thing that the enemy has tried to speak into our lives that you can't, that you're not able, you're not worthy, yada, 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 yada. But that isn't true. Jesus says to us, you can do whatever I say you can do. When I give the word, there's power in the word to carry it out. What an incredible picture. When our mindset changes, everything else changes. See, the mindset we look through changes everything. Let me tell you, we looked at that story from a particular mindset and we saw doubt. We saw a whole host of things. Notice what it says then. And when they got into the boat, the wind stopped, and they were in the boat worshiping him, saying, you are surely the Son of God. Now, that's an interesting picture. Come on, Steve, I need Jesus out here again, would you please? All right, so here's Peter. All right, here we go. Peter's out here. All right, he starts to sink. Jesus reaches out his hand. Peter grabs it, pulls him up. Now, tell me what happens next. They got to walk back the boat. <laughs> Come on, brother. Now, wait a minute. So now Peter and Jesus walk on the water again, all the way back to the boat, and now we both get in the boat. Peter walked out, and Peter walked in. Amen? No wonder they were so surprised <laughs> to, to see him, see him do that. Oh, absolutely. Oh my gosh, can you imagine? Because Jesus just didn't walk on the water. Peter did. Glory be to God. Thanks, Steve. What an incredible picture. The question is, what's Jesus saying? What's he saying? What's going on? What's he desire? There's power in the word of Jesus. Brenda, is there power in the word of Jesus? How many here this morning think there's power in the word of Jesus? Come on. Our minds have to be transformed to begin and renewed to begin to say, you know, if Jesus said it, we can do it. Because he will make sure, enable, and empower, equip us, give us authority to do it. There's power in the word. Look at what it says in Psalms 33. It says, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their lights. So in creation, what happened? God spoke spoke and what happened god spoke as, as king of all he spoke and all of a sudden some folks are like oh man the, the king said something so so they started running around and rounding up protons and all the colors of the rainbow and everything else and they created some light and they brought it to the king is that what happened no what happened pat pat shaking her head like no that did not happen he spoke and instantaneously light out of nothing came into existence by his breath, by that which he spoke, there was incredible power. Now, how many of you are like, well, I'm pretty sure God's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow? How many still believe that when he speaks, there's power in his word? Creative power to do whatever he asks, whatever he desires. He says, hey, this, this, there's power in the word of God. See, when Holy Spirit... When the Spirit of God, when the Spirit of Christ, when Jesus Christ in us, the hope of glory, says, here's what I desire, it is absolutely possible because he said it was. Come on. Come on. Hey, Steve, a little scary? Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's a little scary. Hey, how many of you think it was a little scary getting out of the boat? Oh, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. So how many of us would have been like, be like how hard is that water come on right because stepping out of the boat it gets a little tough out here it's like whoa whoa whoa, whoa way outside the comfort zone right now we've never been here Peter, peter's like i've never been here before amen listen it's faith trusting him not fearing how many of you know there's only 55 days left of christmas it's screaming up on us. Can you imagine? Can you even believe it? 
Kim back there, who is a Christmas lover. I love Christmas too, but she, she, Brenda's a Christmas lover. You know, I want, we haven't got stuff out yet. I'm sure this is going to start sneaking out. <laughs> but here's the deal. In the Christmas story is a statement, a, a verse we quote all the time. Verse 1. Now remember, Luke 1, chapter, verse 37 says this. The angel says to Mary, God, God says to Mary, after he tells her she's going to be pregnant by Holy Spirit, even though she's a virgin. All right? How, how many of you are like, that's, that, that's kind of out there? All right, come on. That's pretty creative. Amen? It says, for nothing will be impossible with God. It says to Mary, for nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be impossible with God. Now, it's interesting, when you look at that phrase, it's so much deeper. Because I want you to understand the word nothing in the Greek is actually two words. No, rhema. Now, you've got to understand rhema, okay? Now, you know, you'll hear me talk about it, and so we've got to explain a little bit. In the Greek language, there are two Greek words that get translated as word, W-O-R-D. One is logos, okay? It's up there. Logos means something that's already been declared, something that's a statement, something that's been written. Okay? We call th this book, the scriptures, is, is the logos of God, the declaration, the written word of God. Okay? But then there's a second Greek word, which is rhema, which refers to a, a revealed word or a breathed word or a freshly spoken word, something that is uttered and released, that is, that is not declared or written down. It's something, something fresh, something a right now word, okay? Right now message. So it says that, it reads, that no freshly spoken word of God, that's what it's saying, for nothing... No freshly spoken word of God is impossible. What God says is not impossible. Okay? But the word impossible is this. It means without power, without strength, without ability. So think about it this way. That no freshly spoken word of God, nothing Jesus says comes without the ability for it to be fulfilled. Everything Jesus says to us, he said, I'll make sure you can do it. I'll make sure it happens. You say, well, what's our part? To participate. What did disciples have to do to feed the 5,000? Can you imagine? <laughs> when they're, they're breaking, the, Jesus broke the loaves and put it in their hands. And they're like, here, I got ha half a biscuit. Come on, Earl, how far does half a biscuit go? Not, in the natural, not very far, does it? Nope, sops up a little gravy, not much. And they went out. Can you imagine what they're thinking? They're breaking off a little, and they're like, I don't know what's going to happen. But all of a sudden, as they began, see, if they had never went and began to break off pieces, they would have never known what God was going to do. Mm -hmm. See, well, here's what happens. So often we get a word from Jesus. He says, here's what I desire, here's what I want to do, here's what I'm calling you to, here's the direction I'm giving you. And we're like, Jesus, I don't see enough, we can't even start. And faith is, no, you said it, so I'm going to begin to walk. I'm Peter. I'm going to begin to get out of the boat and what? And take a step. I understand how I'm going to get there. He's out there a ways, but I'm going to take the first step and the second. And it's in our obedience and our faith that we see the revelation of what Jesus is going to do to fulfill it. It requires faith. Number one, it requires, what did Jesus say? Well, I don't know what Jesus said. Listen, you hear his voice. Amen? Holy Spirit is in you. You hear his voice. My sheep know my voice. So you see, the question on the table is, what's Jesus saying? Last week, I told you about... This house right here, Sherry Jenny's house, um, you know, 81-year-old widow, roof's leaking, you know, you heard the story last week. And what Jesus, I believe Jesus is saying, she needs a new roof. Well, that costs money and labor and lots of other stuff. So, you know, I, I, I challenge you, I say, you know, what, what do you think Jesus is saying? 
But I want to tell you another part of the story because here's what happened on Thursday. See, we, I pick her up on Thursdays for prayer meeting. So I, go, I had to go get her on, the thir- on Thursday, and I wheel in, and I pick her up. And, you know, I got a big truck, so it takes a while to get her up on the uh, step and get her in the truck. And we get in, and I, I sit down, and I, and I no more get my seatbelt on and put it in reverse to back out, and she starts to tell me, about Habitat for Humanity, because she had contacted Habitat for Humanity, we, you know, she needs a roof, and can't you do this, and can't you help me, and yada, yada, yada. She gets a letter. She says, I got a letter, and they said, they think there's probably mildew from a leaking roof, and they aren't interested in doing anything. Now, I don't know about you, but that's sort of like answering the clue phone. Come on, I get in the truck, and the first, I, she doesn't know anything about this. I've not breathed a word of any of this to her. She gets in and says, you know, they're not going to do anything, and I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Man, that's like answering the clue phone when Jesus has already said, Give her, get her a new roof. And then when I took her home, I went inside. I said, you know, I'm kind of curious what the water damage looks like. There's no marks on her ceilings. There's no nothing. The house is firm. The house is steady. This widow needs a roof. That's what she needs. And I believe Jesus said, give her a roof. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to coordinate that. If you're interested in being a part of that, let me know. But we're going to figure out how to get a roof on her house. It's not that big, it's, but it's a big deal. And so that's what we're going to do. Because you know what? That's what Jesus said. Let's do this. And I believe we just got to get out of the boat. And say, if that's what you're saying, Jesus, we're, we're just going to start doing it. In fact, you know, I already kind of, I had to... <laughs> get in her house, I kind of had to let it out a little bit that, hey, I'm kind of interested in what's going on with your roof. But I'm going to tell her this week, you know, we're, we're going to do something. We're going we're to figure out, you know, we're going to trust the Lord for a roof for her house. That's just one thing. But here's the question I have for you this morning. What's Jesus saying to you? What's Jesus saying in your life? What's he been stirring in you? What's that small voice been speaking to you? What's he been asking from you? What's he been desiring from you? And you're looking at it and you're like, I don't know if I can get out of the boat or not. You know, the waves are pretty choppy out there. I don't think I got enough. I'm not sure I'm, I, I have the ability. Jesus didn't say, do you have enough? He simply said, what do you have? Get out of the boat. What do you have? See, all of us in our lives, I believe the Lord is stirring something in us. And the easiest thing to do is to try and. <laughs> da, 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 da. I don't want to hear. No, no, I'm not, I'm not listening to that. Or we can't do that. I can't do that. What's he saying to you? What about your family? What's he saying to your family? About where he's leading you, where he's directing you? I was so blessed, you know, you talking about your grandkids. At some point, the Lord said, take your babies and go to Malaysia. (laughs) Come on, come on. I'm going to get out of the boat. Lord, I have no idea what Malaysia looks like, but I'm out of the boat. You say, well, he's not calling me to go to Malaysia. I didn't say he was. He might be calling you to go across the street. He might be calling you to make a phone call, to stop by, to do, I, I don't know what it is. What's he stirring in your heart? What's he saying? See, what he wants to do is help us renew our minds that he says, no matter what it is I've just said to you, whatever it is that I've been speaking to you, all you got to do is get out of the boat because I've already taken care of it. Trust me. Have faith in me. Same's true for our local church, for for Prairie Grove Christian Church. What's he calling us to? What's Jesus saying? Not what has Jesus said in the past. What's Jesus saying today? What's he speaking today? What are we going to do? What's he directing? What's he leading? I got a few ideas, but you know what? I'm not the only one who hears. Amen? I'm looking at 31 people in this room who hear, who can hear Jesus' voice. What's he stirring? Here's the question. Will we get out of the boat? I'm going to pray, and in a moment, I'm going to invite you. Maybe you, some of you right now, you know exactly what the Lord's been, what Jesus has been stirring in you. 
and you've been holding back because you weren't sure it was even possible or whether you should or, you know. I just want to challenge you this morning to say, you know what, Jesus, today I'm getting out of the boat. I'm going to get out of the boat, and I'm going to begin to take the first step. And if that's you, I'm going to invite you to come just as, as a sign to say, Jesus, I'm out. I'm out of the boat. I want you to come. I'm going to pray, and then we're, we're going to play a song from Casting Crowns. Some of you will recognize. Um, but I want to encourage you just to be obedient to whatever it is that he's saying to you today. And say, Lord, I will. I will. Father, we just thank you for your word, and we thank you that you are, that, Lord, whatever you say, Lord, you've already taken care of what is needed for it to be carried out. And so, Lord, we renew our minds today. Holy Spirit, continue moment by moment, hour by hour to renew our minds that we can see what it is that you have. We hear what you're saying. And Lord, that we can see and hear and understand the way you desire for us to. And Lord, we'd get out of the boat. Lord, we know you've got great things planned for your sons and daughters, for your people, for this church, for this community. And we start today, Lord, with Jesus, what are you saying? I hear you, and I'm going to respond. Father, we thank you now in your mighty name.